Okay, so hello everyone. This is a, it's a brain thing. We have to do this again because uh, this is all being filmed and everything for TV. So um, tonight uh, we're going to have a discussion about attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And uh, luckily, since I'm not much of a child psychiatrist, it's actually the opposite extreme. I'm more of a geriatric psychiatrist, uh, and I don't know a lot about uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. I'll admit that. So. Uh, I have, ha have a special guest with me tonight, uh, Dr. Shelton from the Indianapolis area, trained with me in residency and did a child psychiatry uh, fellowship, and she's certainly an expert in treating ADHD, and so she's going to go over ADHD with you, and then we'll have some questions uh, towards the end, and I think usually we keep this pretty informal, so if you want to ask questions through, through the talk, too, that's fine. Uh, and uh, I'll turn this over to you, Dr. Shelton. hyperactivity disorder and uh, some of you may be familiar with um, ADD as well but it's all now categorized under the ADHD heading and then we subcategorize it um, by subtype so um, I'm going to be referring to all types as uh, ADHD just for simplicity's sake um, and how we subcategorize it is uh, ADHD uh, inattentive type, which was uh, the previously known ADD. Uh, and then there's ADHD hyperactive impulsive type. And then probably the most common one is uh, ADHD combined type, where you have features of both. Um, with uh, ADHD, we look for uh, obviously symptoms that meet um, the inattentive type, there's generally nine uh, particular symptoms that we typically try to, to tease out and find out about. Uh, and to meet the criteria, uh, the person has to uh, meet six of the nine. And generally, when the criteria was originally developed and put into the DSM for uh, the age groups that they uh, did the studies on and, and were looking at were they between the ages of four and 16. So that's generally the age group that we apply the um, criteria to. Uh, and if they meet six of those nine criteria, that generally puts them uh, in at least the 93rd percentile uh, for having uh, ADHD. So you know, we can be pretty confident that, that if, if all of those are there, uh, that it's something that is, that is really a, a true diagnosis. Um, some of the, the criteria I'll go through most of them I do know, but I did bring, bring some cheat sheets to keep me on track. Um, but uh, the inattentive uh, symptoms are that they uh, often fail to give close attention to detail. Uh, they tend to rush through things and make careless mistakes. Uh, we also see them uh, having that difficulty with sustaining attention. And a lot of times we're going to be looking for these uh, symptoms to be present in more than just one setting. So, you know, you'll see it at home and with some things uh, to varying degrees and also at school. And we may not see the symptoms um, to the same degree in each of the settings, but generally we'll see some of it there. And certainly uh, in my practice that's something that I will hear a lot as well is that, well, you know, at home we, we see that, but you know, maybe not so much at school, um, and vice versa. So, um, it, and, and that's a, a pretty common, uh, well-known phenomenon. Um, so the, the difficulty sustaining the attention uh, in tasks, or even in some play activities, depending on the severity of it, um, doesn't seem to listen when spoken to directly. And sometimes, you know, you do have to kind of tease that out. It's like, is it just that selective hearing that all children seem to have? You know, and is there an oppositional kind of a flavor there where they just don't want to hear it? Or is it more of that where they're focused on something else and you really have to get their attention to, to get them to listen and find yourself repeating things over and over? Uh, fail to follow through with instructions. And again, you know, that's something that we do have to, to tease out about whether or not, you know, that's just oppositionality or did they get distracted onto something else. And, you know, sometimes that can be a bit difficult, and certainly uh, kids who have ADHD do have some comorbidities with some of the other disorders, and I can get into some of that a little bit 
later, but we also can see some uh, what we call secondary oppositionality just because of the, um, the ADHD in and of itself. Uh, they generally will have difficulty with organization, and that uh, can be a big one. You know, a lot of times they, they just have a hard time figuring out how to put things together in a step-by-step -step organized type of a fashion. Uh, and that's kind of uh, how, you know, how do they go about completing tasks, and do they have the materials and the things that they need to complete those things, or are, are they always going, oh, gee, I forgot that, so we're going to go, you know, get up and go get that. You know, pencil or a paper, um, and, that, and that leads to another one of the symptoms that we look for is that they're often forgetful. Um, so uh, those kind of go together. They they do tend to be forgetful in, in daily activities, and that's one of our criteria. The other one, another criteria that's related to that is that um, they tend to lose things required uh, for tasks and activities. Uh, they. You know, you'll hear them about them leaving homework at school, or they didn't bring it home, and they didn't bring home the books that they needed, or you know, vice versa. They'll complete their homework, but they forget it at home, and you know, kind of that back and forth issue. Uh, we hear about that quite a bit. Uh, another thing that they tend to do, uh, which a lot of times can also be perhaps misconstrued as being oppositional, is that if something does require uh, sustained mental attention, uh, a lot of times they do try to avoid it. They dislike it and uh, because it is difficult for them uh, and they do tend to be reluctant to engage in those types of activities and tasks. Uh, and that is, again, one of our criteria. And sometimes, like I said, it's not always easy to, to fully tease out uh, whether it's oppositional or not, so you kind of have to put the full picture together. Uh, and again, if they have you know any six of these nine uh, criteria, they'll meet uh, the criteria for ADHD and attentive type. Uh, now with the hyperactive uh, impulsive symptoms, uh, with the hyperactivity, a lot of times we'll hear about fidgeting. They tend to be the, the fidgety, squirmy child. They don't like staying seated. A lot of times that's another one that we'll hear, is that um, they'll leave their seat in situations where they're supposed to remain seated. You know, and I'll hear about that. A lot of times that's a classroom issue that we'll hear about, but sometimes I'll hear about it uh, at home, like at, at the dinner table. You know, they have a hard time even just sitting still and staying seated uh, in that type of a setting or church, um, those kinds of things. Uh, another one of the hyperactivity criteria is that they uh, run about or climb excessively uh, when they're not supposed to when it's an inappropriate time to do so. Uh, they have difficulty playing quietly, and a lot of times we'll hear uh, a child with hyperactivity described as being on the go uh, or driven by a motor. Uh, another one of the criteria regarding hyperactivity is that they talk excessively. That's another one that I hear about a lot um, in the classroom is that uh, they frequently will get uh, marked down or you know different well, the majority of classrooms these days seem to have some sort of behavioral type of uh, record, and so you know they'll move from green to yellow because they were talking when they weren't supposed to be. Um, and associated with that is one of the impulsive uh, things that we hear about, where they blurt things out. They tend to blurt it out before somebody's finished asking the question or making their statement. They're already in there saying the answer. So um, that's another one of our, our criteria, and you know, they'll, they'll get in trouble for that as well. Uh, also along with the impulsivity is that they have difficulty awaiting their turn. A lot of times, you know, the parent will be like, oh yeah, they've got to be first. They're always, you know, getting in trouble for trying to crowd in line and get to be first and, and that. So that's another one that we'll hear uh, as well. And then the final uh, impulsivity one is that they interrupt or intrude on others. And a lot of times I'll ask, you know, because that can be um, with conversation or physically as well. Sometimes they're not very good at noting those physical boundaries and, and kind of maintaining you know, that social uh, circle of space that people like to have. So those are the criteria that I'll ask about when I'm doing a, an interview, especially when I hear about problems with focus and concentration, that'll usually, you know, if I hear, oh yeah, that's a problem, that'll trigger me to ask and go through um, that
that list of questions to, to see, you know, is uh, ADHD something that could be present? Um, and like I, I mentioned before, um, there are uh, other things that we look for. Again, it has to be present in more than one setting. And it also has to cause impairment and distress for the person. And that can be either uh, socially, so with friends, it can be uh, with relationships, you know, with family, or one of the other things is occupationally, and obviously for children, their occupation is going to school and being a student. So if it's causing them impairment uh, in that setting, then that's generally uh, where we, we look for those things. Um, some of the exclusions can, and the, the other things that, that I'll try to, to figure out is, you know, if there's another disorder that's present, such as pervasive developmental disorder or something on the autism spectrum, a lot of times um, those children just with their own disorder have problems with hyperactivity and focus and concentration. And uh, if you talk with any of the experts in uh, autism, you know, to diagnose ADHD in a child with autism, it has to be above and beyond uh, what you typically would expect in, in a uh, typical autistic child. Um, so sometimes that can be a little difficult to, to figure out as well, because uh, I don't know how many of you work with autistic children, but a lot of times there's a lot of variability within that population in and of itself. Uh, the other thing that we have to exclude is whether or not there's a schizophrenia or another uh, psychotic disorder or you know, the possibility of another mental disorder that might be causing problems. Certainly we know that um, depression, one of the criteria um, for depression is problems with focus and concentration. And sometimes with that, um, you know, we'll see hyperactivity because one of the things that can be present with depression is uh, psychomotor agitation. So you know, I always do try to, to find out about a child's mood and what sorts of uh, things might be going on there. Anxiety as well can be uh, something that we would consider because uh, if, if a child is worrying about something, uh, then obviously they're not going to be focusing and paying attention to what they need to be paying attention to. So um, I will generally ask about worries or you know, if they tend to feel anxious or if their parent notes that or has heard that from uh, other people. Uh, some of the other things that that uh, we would consider as well would be uh, some of the personality disorder traits that might be present. Um, some of those uh, can look somewhat similar uh, to ADHD, although there's not really a whole lot of overlap necessarily between the symptomatology. Another big one that's kind of been in the literature lately is bipolar disorder. And certainly there is uh, overlap between uh, the symptoms of ADHD and bipolar disorder, including talking excessively and, and having a high energy level, because certainly people with bipolar disorder, when they're on the, the manic end of things, do tend to become more energized and tend to um, be on the go quite a bit. So that's something that, that um, again, you know, I would be asking about mood symptoms. And certainly in children, uh, bipolar disorder, I don't think is very well uh, categorized as of yet. I know it's something that's uh, a hot topic in the, the literature and people are really trying to, to figure it out. Um, I think it's really difficult, um, at least the way the DSM-4 is now, to, to specifically diagnose bipolar disorder in children because I don't think they have the uh, neurological maturation to fully manifest all of those symptoms. But um, I'll leave that to, to those research experts to be teasing out because I certainly don't know at this point. But the other thing that um, I always do when I'm getting a history is uh, to get a medical history as well. Um, some of the things that can be uh, or look like uh, ADHD can be seizures. Uh, certainly if a child is having absence seizures or um, losing their focus just for a few seconds at a time even. Uh, and that can be uh, uh, look like uh, inattentiveness. Uh, I also ask uh, with everybody whether or not they've had a head injury with loss of consciousness. And uh, in the rehabilitation literature, they're certainly recognizing more so now lately that even a mild concussion uh, can cause uh, some neurological deficits and problems with learning on down the line. So that's something that I usually will uh, try to, to get a history about and, and include. Uh, 
a lot of times if uh, kids have asthma uh, and are using a lot of bronchodilators, you know, those certainly can, can cause um, a child to have a racing heart and uh, make them look a little more speeded up. Uh, and if they're having frequent uh, bounds of asthma and they're on steroids, you know, a lot of children can, a lot of people in general can get uh, almost manic on steroids. So uh, that's something else that I try to, to find out about whether or not that's something that uh, we need to maybe have a discussion with their primary care doctor and see if we need to make some adjustments there. Uh, sleep apnea. Uh, certainly sleep disturbance, especially in kids. Uh, if you've, and I'm sure a lot of you probably have experienced this, uh, had a, a very tired child, they don't necessarily know how to wind down and soothe themselves and can be you know, pretty hyperactive. And certainly if you're not getting enough sleep, uh, you're not really able to, to focus and attend. So, you know, I'll ask about some symptoms that may be associated with sleep apnea, such as snoring, uh, are they a mouth breather, have they had uh, maybe frequent ear infections uh, or uh, sore throats, and take a, a look at that and may, uh, before I necessarily pursue medication, ask to have a sleep study done so that we can, can make sure there's not something going on there as well. Uh, sometimes uh, endocrine problems, such as uh, having a hyperthyroid, can make somebody look uh, more hyperactive. Uh, so uh, if there's a family history, perhaps, of thyroid problems uh, or uh, some concerns about that, then uh, I may do some lab work and, and uh, look at their thyroid. Uh, and also um, looking for lead poisoning, especially if somebody lives in an older house that may have lead-based pain. Uh, can be some other things that I would, would look at. Um, speaking to the prevalence of ADHD, uh, the, the literature says that about 3 to 7% of children uh, will meet the DSM-4 criteria for combined and hyperactive impulsive types. Uh, if you add in the inattentive type, the ADHD inattentive type, then that number doubles uh, to 6 to uh, 14 percent uh, prevalence rate. Uh, and there certainly uh, can be some persistence of ADHD into adulthood. Uh, right now, the, the uh, prevalence uh, can be is estimated to be about 3 to 5 percent of uh, adults would meet um, DSM-4 criteria. Uh, for, for all types of ADHD. Uh, risk factors for ADHD, uh, again, a lot of this I'll kind of try to tease out as I'm getting my history, would be uh, heredity. You know, it's a, a very highly genetically transmitted disorder. You know, it's not uncommon for me to hear uh, from one parent or the other that, well, I had a lot of symptoms like this with, when I was in school, but, you know, it wasn't really diagnosed back then or treated, but I think I probably did. You know, that's not uh, an uncommon statement for me to, to hear. Uh, also, um, male sex. Uh, boys actually tend uh, to have it, or seem to have it a little bit more uh, than girls do. Uh, a three, there's a three to one uh, male to female in uh, community samples uh, per the studies, and uh, five to one uh, up to nine to one in uh, clinical samples. So. Uh, people who are actually seeking treatment a lot of times, but more often than not, it is uh, boys outnumbering the girls. Uh, and I, I think that a lot of times in girls, uh, it may be missed until they're a little bit older. Uh, boys do seem to have more hyperactivity associated with theirs, and the girls tend to be a little quieter and have more of that uh, inattentive type, so they don't necessarily draw the attention of uh, the teacher in the classroom, and, and uh, then that a lot of times is what will trigger uh, the, the investigation and, and looking into that. Uh, some other risk factors, uh, a lot of times I, I do take uh, a pregnancy and birth history, uh, and with that I'll ask about tobacco exposure because that can, uh, tobacco exposure during pregnancy can uh, lead to a higher risk for the development of ADHD as well as uh, maternal alcohol use uh, during pregnancy, uh, and then some perinatal factors including uh, prematurity uh, or very low birth weight. 
there certainly are, ADHD a lot of times does not exist by itself. A lot of times there are what we call comorbidities or coexisting conditions. Probably one of the most common ones is uh, oppositional defiant disorder. And that uh, is a disorder where there's a more pervasive uh, uh, oppositionality uh, than you, you necessarily would see with just ADHD alone. Uh, they typically uh, won't take direction from almost any uh, authority figure and have a tendency to uh, be uh, fairly defiant. Uh, so uh, there's about a 40 to 67 percent uh, comorbidity of uh, oppositional defiant disorder. Uh, a little bit more serious of a disorder is conduct disorder, and that's where they actually tend to kind of step over the societal uh, norms and, and start actually doing some outright law breaking uh, with conduct disorder. There's about a 20 to 50, uh, 56% comorbidity rate with that. Uh, with some of our mood disorders, uh, major depression and bipolar disorder, depends on you know the studies, but uh, with major depression, there's anywhere from 0 to 30%, depending on which study you look at. With bipolar disorder, 0 to 20%. Uh, one of the things that I do a lot of times uh, try to, to get in my history taking is uh, asking whether or not they've had any uh, testing done through the school because there is anywhere from 25 to 50% uh, comorbid uh, learning disabilities. Uh, so that's something that uh, I'll encourage people to, to maybe take a look at uh, as well, especially if uh, there does seem to be some uh, impairment with learning and, and acquisition of actual uh, knowledge. So uh, there has been some discussion in the literature about ADHD being what they call a disorder of uh, executive functions. And I'll talk to my families about that. Uh, our brain and our uh, frontal cortex and prefrontal cortex, that's the main area of our brain that kind of helps us with uh, attending to things, uh, deciding what is important and what isn't. Uh, so, you know, helping us uh, stay on track, stay on task, uh, not becoming distracted into things that are not important. Uh, it helps us with organization and deciding, you know, triaging kind of what's important and what isn't. Uh, and a lot of times if, uh, that, if they're taking a look, I think, a little bit more at that particular area of the brain. Uh, and a lot of our medicines actually tend to, uh, to focus uh, on uh, improving, I guess, the function of that uh, area of the brain. It's fairly rich in uh, dopamine and norepinephrine. And uh, a lot of our drugs, especially uh, the stimulant medications, tend to uh, in increase the let down of dopamine uh, and or norepinephrine, uh, depending on which uh, stimulant you, you choose. And uh, they, the stimulants uh, generally are my first line uh, of treatment uh, for ADHD. You know, they've been out there for a long time. Uh, they do have uh, concerning side effects, but generally by the time uh, most people get to me, uh, they've already had some other interventions. Uh, if not, then sometimes I will suggest that that maybe, uh, especially if it's a younger child, that we look at uh, doing some therapy first uh, to see if we can can get some things uh, looked at and, and dealt with uh, before we, we go to medication, uh, because there are side effects uh, to our medication. Uh, the stimulants, um, as some of you may know, can decrease appetite, increase heart rate, increase blood pressure, uh, so they do have uh, some impact more globally on the child than, than just uh, improving their focus and concentration. And with anything, you're uh, looking at your benefits versus your risks. Uh, so, uh, but I think the, the stimulants have generally proven across the years to be very good at, at providing a good intervention. Uh, and uh, they also tend to be fairly uh, flexible and versatile uh, because uh, they don't stay in the system uh, all the time. So if we do want to take a break on the weekends or uh, when school's not in session, they're a little bit more uh, amenable to that uh, occurring. Uh, Stratera is also uh, another drug uh, that's out there. It's uh, the only one that would probably be classified as a non-stimulant that has uh, an indication for ADHD. So uh, that's something that's uh, an option as well. And, uh, you know, you're going to, uh, as a physician, you're going to tailor your 
treatment to the full history, so there are certainly some cases where I may uh, go with that particular uh, medication first. Um, with uh, different sorts of resources that I'll direct uh, parents to, a lot of times, uh, as many of you may know, this is going to affect a child in the classroom, so a lot of times I'll uh, let parents know that they may want to have a conversation uh, with their teacher. Some people want the school to know, some people don't, uh, the majority do. Uh, and I will encourage them to, to uh, get in touch uh, with the, the teacher and, and let them know, you know that we are starting medication because it's important for me as uh, the prescribing uh, doctor to, to get feedback from all the different uh, sources that I can uh, so I can make the best decision about uh, whether or not we need to continue with that medication, do we need to look at something else. Uh, and also, uh, there certainly are interventions within the classroom that can be made to help uh, the student perform better. Uh, I don't necessarily make specific uh, recommendations along those lines, but uh, I think there are certainly um, uh, lots of different resources out there that talk about uh, <coughs> some of the interventions that can be helpful uh, with different students in the classroom. And some of, some students need a little bit more intervention than others because uh, like any other uh, disease or disorder we have, there's varying degrees of severity. Uh, so some people are much more mild and are able to compensate uh, better than others. Uh, some of the other resources that I'll talk to families about uh, include these that uh, or this particular one that Dave wrote up for me, the uh, CHAD. And they're a fairly large organization, uh, children and adults with uh, attention deficit disorders. Uh, and they generally have a lot of different uh, literature uh, that are available uh, for people to use. Uh, and as families in Indiana are trying to uh, figure out how to, to go about getting services for their children within the school, I'll also uh, talk with them about uh, Article 7, which uh, is the Indiana uh, law about uh, Americans with disabilities uh, and kind of helps with uh, moderating uh, what interventions and when uh, should be made by a school. Uh, if the, the, and some schools are starting to uh, categorize ADHD under otherwise health impaired. Uh, some schools don't. Uh, and then in that case, that's when I would talk with them about um, a Section 504 plan that can be put into place, which also allows an individualized education plan to be uh, made for the child. So that's really all I have today. I know I threw a lot of information at you very quickly. <laughs> but if you guys have any questions, please feel free. Yeah. You mentioned the uh, stimulants. Um, Mr. Chair, I recognize uh, Ritalin, of course, is among the oldest drugs, I guess, mm -hmm. for this kind of thing. Um, but as far as the side effects, like the facial rash, um, tummy upset, loss of appetite, do these go away? Does, does the sucker grow out of them? Well, that uh, varies from person to person, whether or not um, it'll go away or not. Uh, and I certainly have had um, some where uh, we haven't been able to get that particular, like with the, the stomach pain. Um, that's one that I'll, that I'll hear about. Uh, and I'll generally hear that more as we have to go up on the dose. Um, sometimes on the lower doses, um, I don't hear about it, and then maybe you know they're not focusing and concentrating as well, so we have to do, or we, we decide to try and increase, and then um, I'll start hearing about some stomach pain in that. Um, typically, I, for the most part, I found um, that if I start low enough and I can get it into the person's system at a lower dose, uh, then uh, I generally am a little bit more successful at bypassing that. Um, but there certainly are some people where um, that particular side effect doesn't go away, and then you know we we may decide to try something else. Uh, sometimes switching uh, to a different. Uh, stimulant or to a different formulation, uh, even if it's the same active ingredient like methylphenidate, which uh, Ritalin is one, um, but there certainly are multiple other formulations of that, uh, including Concerta, uh, where it's a capsule on the outside of the capsule, 
um, is a coating of methylphenidate, then uh, there's three different compartments inside the capsule. There's a um, absorption compartment where uh, fluid from the gut is absorbed. There's a push compartment, and then there's uh, the medication compartment, which is filled with the, the liquid, uh, liquid form of methylphenidate. And as it goes through the gut, the liquid is absorbed in a, uh, from the gut, and then the liquid methylphenidate gets pushed out over time. Uh, some, so, and then uh, there's a few others that uh, are a capsule as well, where they have sprinkles inside. Uh, and I found, uh, especially with some of my younger patients, that if we just switch formulation, we might actually get uh, a little bit different of a, of a response, including different side effects. So, you know, I'll, I'll, we'll generally kind of talk, and, and based on what I'm hearing, you know, we'll, we'll make a decision about what seems to be best.